We do believe in go and tell it on the mountain. We want the whole world to know about Jesus. So we send out mission teams all over the world all the time. And Ken Meyer just got back from um, Peru and the Andes Mountains helping out in an orphanage. Orphanage there, so it's great to have him back. And it's great to be part of a church that really wants to reach the whole world with the gospel of Christ. Let's pray together. Father, as we look into your word, I pray that uh, you would... uh, open up our hearts and minds to what you have for us this day. We thank you for your word. We just love your word. We value it. We honor it. We want to submit to it. We want to put ourselves under your scriptures. Lord, give us willing hearts. Give us hearts that obey what you tell us. I pray that we would understand the great love that you have for us. I pray that we would understand the great forgiveness that's available to us. And we thank you for the forgiveness that we have in Christ. I pray that would be ours this day. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in an Advent series called Jesus Our Hope, and we're going to look at different aspects of hope. This morning we're going to look at the, our hope for forgiveness. And so if you'll open up your Bibles to Luke Chapter 5, verses 17 through 25, we're going to look at how to experience the forgiveness of God. When Joseph heard that Mary was pregnant, and they were not married yet, they were engaged, an engaged couple, he, uh, of course, was greatly taken aback by that, and he wasn't sure what to do with that information And uh, he was thinking about breaking off that engagement. Uh, Back then, it was almost like a divorce. And so he uh, was considering that. And an angel came to him and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son And you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And so right away we understand the purpose, the mission, of the reason why Christ came was to forgive us, was to save us, was to redeem us from our sins. Sin is a huge problem. And God wanted to do something about sin because sin affects every aspect of our lives. It affects nature, affects the universe. And Paul tells us in Romans that the creation itself is longing for redemption. The creation is longing to be redeemed when Jesus will come back again and creation will be all that it was supposed to be. And so sin affects every aspect of our lives. It affects us personally, it affects nature, affects our marriages, affects our workplace, affects our church, it affects our families. It's just everywhere. So God saw that. You may not see it. You may not think it's a big deal. You may just pass over that and say, well, I've heard that before. Yeah, I'm a sinner. But God looks at it totally different. And he says, this is a problem. This is a huge, huge issue. And so he did something about it. He sent Christ, who was born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit, so that he could be a perfect man and, of course, retain his deity as God. And so the saving and the forgiveness of sin is one of the great purposes why Christ came. Go 30 years later, so we have that revelation to Joseph and Mary that Jesus, which means the Lord saves, this revelation that this baby, this one they named Jesus, the Lord saves, would save you and I. 30 years later, that same theme is picked up. John the Baptist Jesus' cousin sees Christ coming and he looks out at Jesus and he says, Behold, 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so we see this theme again. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we see that the purpose and the reason why Christ came was because of your sin and my sin. And he wants to do something about it, and he did something about it by becoming the Lamb of God, by being that perfect sacrifice, by dying on the cross, taking our sins upon himself, taking that off you, off your shoulders, off your conscience, off, and taking the guilt and the shame and all that is part of that. And he takes that from you, and he pays for it on the cross. And so we know that Jesus came to die and to be an atonement for us and to take our place as a a debt that we owe our God. So forgiveness is huge. And Jesus wanted to make a point about forgiveness. He wanted us to understand, clearly understand this issue, that he is the only one who has the authority to forgive you of your sin. There is no one else. He is the only one who can do that. And so he makes a point of that. And he got in a lot of trouble. You know, Jesus wasn't afraid to stir things up. He wasn't afraid to get people mad at him, angry at him, so angry they wanted to kill him. And we read about this story in Luke chapter 5. Uh, verses 17 through 25. First of all, if we want to experience this forgiveness of God, we have to come to Jesus. We have to go to him. One day as he was teaching, Jesus was mainly a teacher. He was a rabbi. He was a, a teacher who grew up in the outback, the backwaters of, of Israel, where no known scholars, teachers, those that were more of a working class came from, but yet he was elevated as the greatest teacher. Of course, today we know that he's the greatest teacher ever to live was Jesus. And he had no PhDs and doctorates. No, I'm not against all that, of course. But he was trained in a simple home by simple parents who taught him the word of God. And that is the greatest thing, the greatest treasure that we have. And if you grew up in a Christian home where you were taught the word of God, that is a tremendous gift from God to you. And so he was taught and was a carpenter's son, a tradesman, and uh, he uh, was not part of the intellectual elite He was not part of those who were trained in Jerusalem uh, and in the schools of that day, the universities. But uh, he was a simple carpenter from Nazareth, and he is there teaching. But by the way, he is God, so he doesn't need a PhD, so he sort of knows everything. So he's God, and he's teaching. And Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Now the Pharisees were a group of men, about 6,000 of them, there weren't that many, who took the scriptures and added a ton of traditions and a ton of laws and policies and uh, sort of like our federal government. No, I shouldn't say that, but just tons of stuff. Just, they, they would have done great in our government. Just the bigger, the better. The more pages you try to explain something, the better it is. And so they added a lot. There's 600 more laws that they put on this book. And uh, they were, so, so I think in the beginning they meant well, but it ended up just being something very external. Something that you just did. Some tradition. And they lost The essence of this book, and the essence of this book, is to love God and to love others. And so they're they're there, the Pharisees, teachers of the law. Teachers of the law would be the very best. It would be the lawyers who 
looked at these 600 laws, looked at the scriptures, and uh, sort of interpreted for the people, and who had come from every village of Galilee. And so the Pharisees teach the law. They're looking for a way to catch Jesus. They didn't like Jesus. In fact, they were part of the group that put him to death. And uh, they were looking. So they came from Galilee, from Judea and Jerusalem, and they're sitting there, and they're listening to Jesus. And you know, Jesus loved every single man there. He loved them so much. He was concerned about them. He wanted to teach them the truth of God. But they were not willing to accept. And so then the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. So he's teaching, but he's also healing. And that power, of course, uh, comes from the Holy Spirit. He's filled the Spirit of God. The power of God's upon him. Spirit of God's upon him. The Father sent him. The Son, the Son comes. The Spirit of God and dwells Jesus himself. And so there's power there. There's moments there. I think that's true. I think there are moments when God's power is there, and when you're in that moment, you better not miss it. Because God's there. And so there's this, there's this sacred moment. The Spirit of God's there. Jesus is there. The Father's pleased. The Trinity is there. And things are happening. And people are healed. And I'm not talking about, you know, there's nothing wrong with praying about a headache. But I'm talking about healings that you can see. People who can't walk, walking instantly. And so God's power is there. And some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat. And so there's, we don't know much about this paralytic. We don't know why he was paralyzed. We don't know what was involved in that. Was he paralyzed from the waist down, neck down, but he couldn't move. He was immobile. It's hard to be immobile, isn't it? It's frustrating. It's scary not to be able to move. Not to be able to go from point A to point B. And so this man, we don't know why. Was it genetic? Was it something from birth? Did his nurse fall and, and when he was a baby and fell and he hit himself, broke his body? Was it later on? Was, it, was he putting up his lights for Christmas? I don't know, on a ladder. If something happened... And, uh, you know, God's here to redeem everything. He's not going to, he, he's going to heal some, but our ultimate healing is when he comes back and we get our glorified bodies. And we won't have to deal with this thing they call our, our body and all the ins and all the ups and downs of that whole thing of, of sickness and all of that. But this man was sick. He was paralyzed. But he had others who loved him. Four other men loved him. You know, to be a paralytic during that time, the Pharisees said the, the reason why you're a paralytic is because you, you did something so awful that, um, that uh, that's the reason why you're the way you are. I mean, that, that, that was not a fun thing because back then we, they didn't have canes and wheelchairs and everything else that we have today. I mean, you were really in trouble. And uh, they probably made fun of him and they ostracized him and he's probably a very poor man. And so these men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and they, they, they tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. They knew they had to get this man to Jesus and they were desperate to get this man to Jesus and they would do anything to put him in the place in the hands of God himself. And so, verse 19, when they could not find a way to do this, 
because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. And so they said, they were pretty innovative. They said, let's get up on roof. I did a little research on roofs. You interested in roofs? We love roofs in this church. We're always talking about our roof anyway. So, so a roof in that day was wooden beams, and then you crossed them with wood planks, and then you put, I don't know why they did this, put basically dirt and straw on there, and then you put on tiles if you had money. And it was about a foot thick. So, you know, this is no big, this is like not a thatched roof where you just sort of, oh, there you are. Uh, it was a big deal. And so these men were very, very focused on, on their mission. And the mission was to get them and themselves to Jesus. And so they're tearing out this roof and... Jesus is trying to teach. I don't know how he taught. I mean, it'd be a little distracting for me if someone was starting to come through the roof right here. What would you think of that? They wanted to come here to church so badly, they climb our roof and put a hole in it. And I'd say amen to that. Amen? Let's get to Jesus. And there they are, and Jesus is teaching and they lower that man. Now, I believe that this man not only had a physical problem, but he had a spiritual problem. I think he was aware of it, too, and that he had a sin problem. You know, just because you're disabled and you're, doesn't mean you don't have a sin problem. Just because you're whatever doesn't mean you don't have a sin problem. He, he knew about his sin problem. Maybe it was the hatred he had toward others because they hated him. And they, he was treated so badly. Maybe he's bitter. Maybe he's angry at God. How could you do this to me? I didn't deserve this. Why can't I play like the other kids? Why can't I go to school? Why can't I go to the baseball game? Why do I have to be stuck here? Day after day after day after day. Where are you, God? Maybe that was it. But there was a big sin issue. Our problem is not always the physical. It's the bitterness that we have in our hearts. There was something big in his life. Because verse 20 says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, rise and walk. Do you say that? Friend, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. What an awesome statement. What a relief. Let me ask you a question. If you are diagnosed with cancer tomorrow, it'd be a tough thing, man. It's that uh, my heart just goes out to this. Oh, I just, I just feel so bad for people who get that news. But if, if, you were to hear that and God gave you a choice between your sins being forgiven and being healed, what would you choose? See, we don't think this is it. We're bothered by this story because we think, Jesus, who cares whether your sins are forgiven or not? The important thing is that man is not walking. He needs to walk. So get with the program, Jesus. Heal that man. And God doesn't see it that way. He sees that your problem is sin. And that has to be taken care of. 
first. Friend, your sins are forgiven. Your sins, that's personally this man. He's talking about this man. He's looking at this man who, who you know, some of us would say, well, Jesus, that's pretty cruel, don't you think? That's cruel to say your sins are forgiven when he needs to be healed. And Jesus say, no. It's through the forgiveness of sins that our ultimate healing will come when Jesus will come back and we will get our glorified bodies because of our love for him. And so they came to Jesus. And secondly, we, we have to move along here quickly. So if you'll stay right with me. Believe the promise. We have to believe this promise. Not everyone believes this promise that your sins are forgiven. Not everyone buys it. Not everyone thinks that that happens. Not everyone believes that the transaction at that moment when Jesus said, friend, your sins are forgiven, at that moment, immediately, those sins were gone and they were put into the deepest sea and they were covered by the blood of Jesus and that man was saved in that moment. Lots of people don't believe that. And right away we get some folks who, who don't believe what Jesus is saying. The Pharisees and teachers of the law begin thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? They're, they were the, theologically correct in that statement. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Only God can forgive sins because our sin is not against me or you. How can I ever forgive you of your sin when your sin has nothing to do with me but everything to do with God Almighty? So only he can do that. And so they had that right. And so verse 22, Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Why do you think this? Don't you know I'm God? Don't you know that I, you're, I can forgive this man's sins? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and, and walk? Interesting question. I wish we had time to delve into that. That's a deep question. What do you think? And on the surface, the answer seems obvious. But if you go deep into that question, you'll see that both are impossible. And the greatest gift of all is your forgiveness of sins. Because it took Jesus to go to the cross for your sins to be forgiven. But on the surface, it's a fair question. Of course, I can say your sins are forgiven, but I don't know. There's no proof. I don't know. Jesus saying your sins are forgiven, but we don't have empirical proof about that, do we? Do we? Can you tell if that man's sins are forgiven or not? You can't. Jesus was just an amazing teacher. So he's, in, he's getting there. He says... No, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven than to heal this man on the surface. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He wants us to know this. Luke included this in this gospel because there was questions about this. It is our only forgiveness of sins through Christ or is it through the temple worship? It's through, still through offering sacrifices and all of that. Is that, is that part of it? Or, and so Luke includes this story and Jesus makes it very clear that the Son of Man does have authority to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. And so Jesus does this miracle. See, every miracle, every healing is a sign, is, it, it's a parable. It, 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 there's a reason for it. And the reason why this man could walk, because Jesus wanted to make sure that we understood that he is the only one who can forgive us 
our sins. You have to believe that promise. You have to have faith. If you don't have faith in that, then you're like the Pharisees and the scribes and the Pharisees and everybody else on the whole planet who doesn't believe this gospel message. Faith is the key, and that's the last thing we want to end with. We have to live in faith. Verse 25, immediately. I love that word immediately. This man is exercising his faith when he says to you, I take they tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. There is a participation of his faith with Christ's commands. You gotta move. You gotta have faith. You've gotta, you've gotta move those limbs that haven't moved forever. Now that's a miracle in itself because I understand if you don't move, things get a little spongy. I, that's not a good medical term. It's not, it's not good for you just to lay that late, late. Lay, lay around and not move, something happens to your muscles, I believe. And so he, he hasn't moved for a long time. And he believes what Jesus said, and so he begins to move. And he stands up. And he took what he'd been lying on, and I believe that's a symbol for that man forever and ever, to know that his sins are forgiven. And he went home, praising God. He goes back home. And that's really our journey, too. We follow the same pattern, this man. You come to Jesus. You hear his promise. You receive it. And you go away different. But you know what? God sends you back home where it may be hard and it may be difficult and it may be a problem but he sends you back where you live and that's the hard part because you don't want to go back there. You want to stay right in the presence of Jesus. You want to be with him after you've had your forgiveness of your sin and you're healed again. Why wouldn't you want to hang around Jesus forever? He says, no, I want you to go back home. I want you to go back maybe where they don't like you, where there's problems, where there's issues, where there's work issues, and there's this issue, and there's that issue, and there's this coming at you, and that's coming at you. I want you to go back into that situation. And I want you to live for me. And that man went back. A changed man. Sort of like church. I love church. I've been in church for a long, long time, since I was a baby. My parents, bless their hearts, they took me to church all the time. And I never rebelled against church. I always, some people do, some kids do, and some of my brothers did, but I didn't. I, I just love church. Always have. There's something unique here. But you know what? When, you, when we're done with communion, you've got to walk out those doors. You know what? You've got huge challenges you've got to face. And that's what this is all about, is to strengthen you, remind you of the promises of God, to refocus you, so that when you leave, you can go out with the Spirit of God in your heart, with the Father's pleasure, and with the Son giving his life for you. And you can go out and you can live for him. We're going to take communion. And we're going to do a little different today. We're going to have you come forward because I like what that'll do for us. It's sort of like the story. This man had to come to Jesus and go through a crowd and, and finally comes to Christ and Christ tells him 
those words that he would never forget, friend, your sins are forgiven. And so I'm gonna have you just come forward after I pray. And as you come, I, I hope the Spirit of God will say to you, friend, your sins are forgiven. I paid the price. The bread represents the body of Christ. This is my body. The blood represents, or the cup represents his blood that was shed for you. And so I, I, I just pray that there would just be a divine moment when you will know that you know, that you know, that you know, that your sins are forgiven, they're gone, they're washed away by the blood of Christ. Father, as we go into this time, I pray, Lord, that we would come to you like that man came, needy, broken, needing to hear from you, needing a word, needing to hear those words, friend, your sins are forgiven. I pray that we would hear those words even now as we go forward, that we, oh God, would understand the price you paid. This is more difficult to have our sins paid for by you. I pray that as we are partake together that you would speak to us. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Feel free to come. If you can't come, we have an usher back there who would love to serve you, but just uh, as God leads you, come, then go back to your pews and just wait a moment and we'll all uh, have a benediction together.
Let's stand for the benediction. Maybe you're here and you need someone to pray for you, like those four men who brought that needy man, and you, you need some men and women around you just to help you find Christ, help you get in front of Jesus. If there's an illness, you have health issues, we can pray for you. If you have other things happening in your life, feel free to come and just sit in these pews. and Your friends will come and they'll gather around you and pray for you. We are a family. We're a family of God. We care for each other. We pray for each other. Lord, we thank you for Christ. Without him, we would go into a hopeless eternity, never seeing you, never hearing from you, never knowing you, never being able to pray and praise you, never being able to worship you. We'd be totally cut off from you forever and ever and ever. But Christ has changed all that. And we are eternally grateful to you. Thank you, Lord, for this time when we could be reminded that our sins are truly forgiven. We're free. Thank you for that. Thank you for sending Christ. Go with us as we leave. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Greet one another. Say hello to somebody. Would you do that?